Well, I am thrilled today to um, introduce our speaker, um, a good friend of mine and a, and a board member of, of ours at the Fund for the Arts, Jim Allen. Um, Jim is the president, chairman, and chief executive officer for Hilliard Lions. He has devoted his entire career to working for the firm um, and started there in 1981. He was named president in 2003, and then he was elected chairman and CEO of the company in 2004. He's been active in the financial services industry with the Sur Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, where he currently serves on the board of directors. Really, he has um, been an incredible leader in so many um, civic organizations and in so many ways, not just as a board member, but leading those organizations. And I will share just a couple of those with you. He is the current board chair of the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation. And I'll tell you, I know that um, many of you all work with Jim in this way, but he is um, deeply devoted to um, moving forward education and public education in our community. He has um, past chair of the Fund for the Arts Board of the Louisville Downtown Development Corporation. He works on the Business Leader Champions for Education and is a board member of the Sigma Chi Foundation. He also works at the um, university level with the University of Louisville School of Business um, on the advisory board. He's on the board of trustees for Bellarmine University and the Dean's Advisory Council for the Fisher College of Business at Ohio State University. His awards are, um, he's been recognized here in our community by Junior Achievement in the Kentuckiana Business Hall of Fame. He's been recognized by the Kentucky Board of Education with the Joseph W. Kelly Award. He has been recognized by YMCA with the Spirit of Louisville Award and recognized by Business First as Business Leader of the Year. And those are just to name a few. Um, we are great, grateful for Jim's leadership in so many ways. I am privileged to work with him myself and have learned so much from him. His degree is from DePaul University, his MBA in finance from Ohio State, um, of which um, Jim is a, a big fan. And um, I think last but not least, he's married to um, his incredible wife, Missy, and his daughter, Rebecca, is now in education as a teacher at Collegiate. So with that, welcome, Jim. We look forward to it. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and Kristen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I think it's, uh, it's interesting that Kristen uh, got to do that or had to do that. I'm not sure how that worked. Um, but I had the good fortune of, when I was chairman of the Fund for the Arts Board, of being the one who got to hire Kristen as our executive director. And so you, Kristen was preceded by preceded by Barbara Sexton Smith, and when Barbara announced uh, sh shortly into my tenure in that role that she was going to retire, I thought, oh boy, what next? And we were so fortunate to have Kristen right here in this community waiting in the wings, and she is just doing an absolutely terrific job in that capacity and has brought a real strategic thinking dimension to it. So we're going to see great things for the, from the arts going forward, and it's a function of, of Christian's, or Kristen's leadership. Also can't help but acknowledge that Hilliard Lyons is obviously a big supporter. I'm on the fun board, but we also have representation on the orchestra board, the opera board, the ballet board, actors theater board, and stage one board. So Hilliard is a big believer in the arts, and we've got a lot of representation there. Uh, she, uh, Kristen also acknowledged my interest in education, and I'm very proud of the Hilliard Lions Teacher Excellence Awards, and we'll be in the fourth year of that program, where we recognize Jefferson County Public School uh, teachers for their great work, and about 50 get recognized each year, and it's a great way to provide some positive reinforcement to a group of people who work incredibly hard and who don't necessarily get the recognition that they deserve. I'm excited that this year uh, Matt Bevan is going to be our keynote speaker for that event. So we've had Greg Fisher, we've had Jim Ramsey, had a gentleman by the name of Marshall Goldsmith who's a fascinating guy who was a, a Valley High School graduate. Um, and so anyhow, we're excited to continue to support that program going forward. Just a little bit about Hilliard Lions and some observations about our industry and outlook for where things are going. Hilliard Lions is 162 years old.
this year. In fact, somebody asked me if I had uh, presented to this group before, and I think the answer is yes, I did so uh, when we turned 150 years old. So it's been 12 years since I had the opportunity to be in front of you, so it's great to, great to be back. The good news for me is that I turned gray at an early age, so all that I've been through in financial services and the ups and downs of the market have had no impact on my hair because it, it was already this color. <coughs> We were, uh, in fact, uh, 2015, we celebrated the 50-year anniversary of actually the merger of J.J.B. Hilliard and Son and W.L. Lyons and Company. So that occurred in, in 1965. We operated as a partnership from 65 to 72, incorporated, and then, of course, in 1998, um, sold the company to PNC Bank. And so we were part of PNC from 1998 to 2008. In the summer of 2007, I was at three years into my uh, term as CEO, I get the call to go to Pittsburgh, and that's when PNC informed us of their decision to, to sell Hilliard. And quite frankly, we'll be forever grateful to PNC for the way in which they handled Hilliard throughout our 10-year term there. They could have tried to make us something we weren't intended to be, fit a square peg in a round hole, try and force it. But instead, uh, they opted to sell us, and, and for us, that I think for them it was a good decision. They recognized more value from the company that way, and from our standpoint, it allowed the company to remain intact. We had been the platform within PNC and had really maintained most of our operations and support. So for us, we were able to get the toothpaste back in the tube when the opportunity uh, presented itself really proud of our organization because, of course, that hap this happened at a very, very challenging time uh, in history. We announced the deal in November of 2007 with the goal of closing at the end of the first quarter of 2008. And so if six weeks in advance of that, we did an internal private placement among our employees to share ownership with Houchins Industries and Bowling Green. So they stepped in and underwrote the entire purchase price of the deal. I'm streamlining the story a little bit, but really stepped up in our behalf. Our pledge to them was that we would raise capital to share ownership with them. So six weeks in advance of that uh, scheduled closing at the end of March of 08, we did an internal private placement and raised just over $100 million from our employees, which is really a staggering amount, especially at a point in time when things were getting a little bit uh, dicey. In fact, the week that we signed our subscription agreements, to uh, commit to buying the company was the week that Bear Stearns imploded. So we were right at the front end of what was going to be a very, very uh, interesting first year to get your company back. So we're really pleased about that. In fact, when, when I tell this story, and, and frequently people will say, well, gosh, that was really tough timing. Or some folks will say, that was really great timing. And it's a question of whether or not you're a short-term or long-term investor. If you're a long-term investor, it was great timing. If you were a short-term investor, it was it was tough timing. But we feel very, very blessed to have the company back. It really is that ownership and, and ownership and it, it creates that esprit de corps in the, in the organization, this commitment level that really is, is hard to replicate. So very, very pleased and proud of the organization and the fact that we are 162 years old with really a committed group of employees. Hilliard has been voted a best place to work in Kentucky for 10 years in a row. So I think we're about to enter the best places to work Hall of Fame, which is exciting for us. We're frequently a best place to work in all the other states where we have enough critical mass to, uh, to qualify for that. So uh, very proud of that as well. Hilliard today has 70 offices in 12 states. We're in the Midwest and Southeast, and that is our footprint, and the footprint that we are really content to continue to build out. We don't have aspirations to be a national company. We really are focused on the quality of what we deliver on behalf of our clients, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The business has changed dramatically uh, since I joined the company in 1981. It has really become a, a wealth management business. So what is rooted in a regional brokerage firm has now become wealth planning in nature, with advice is really the value proposition that we deliver for our clients. We have a trust company that has $7 billion in assets in it, and so we had the first non-bank trust charter in the state of Kentucky dating back to 1984. And the trust business has really been a, a good one for us to be in. We actually think the trust business going forward is even going to be a bigger deal for us with an aging demographic, wealth creation, and, and the needs that the trust company can certainly meet uh, on behalf of our clients. We're also in the investment banking space. 
but they're really in the sort of the small to middle market M&A with that focus uh, because of our desire to support our private client uh, business model that we have. We have about $43 billion in client assets, including that $7 billion for the trust company that I referenced. Some recent deals for uh, our investment banking group include advising the board of directors of Hillrick and Bradsby with respect to the spin out to um, Wilson. Uh, the valuation f uh, and sale of Vision First, a Louisville-based eye care provider, uh, to its employees via an ESOP. Uh, capital raises for two Midwestern companies, Regency Associates in Evansville and Dental Care, Dental Care Plus in Cincinnati. And then, of course, closer to home, we actually uh, were the advisor on the sale of Party Mart to Blue Equity. So we were glad to keep Party Mart local. And so that was uh, an exciting one to be part of. On the public finance side, of course, we do a lot of work there in terms of uh, municipal bond financing. That business has changed in that you can't be a financial advisor and an underwriter in the same deal. And it's just part of the regulatory push to divide responsibilities to minimize the potential for conflicts of interest. So we continue to be, we were an underwriter initially with the KFC Yum Center. In fact, if Jim Host were here today, he would say yet again that the Yum Center wouldn't have happened when it did without Hilliard Lyons. And we stepped in to underwrite some of the subordinated taxable bonds that made that all possible there at the end in, in the summer of 2008. But we continue to go forward with the uh, Yum Center in a financial advisory capacity there. Um, we were the senior manager this past summer for Bellarmine University in a $35 million deal that, that uh, created some new financing for the Centro project, but also enabled them to refinance some outstanding issues. Uh, we've been the financial advisor to the city as it relates to the Omni project and the $109 million deal that has been done for that. We're uh, an FA to the University of Kentucky on a $155 million deal there, and we're also working with the University of Louisville in a financial advisory capacity on an upcoming $91 million deal there. So our uh, engagement in the community and in the region is one that we think is really significant in terms of supporting economic development and activity that might not be here if, if not for our ability to, with the help of Houchins, get the company back. So again, we're proud to be part of that and contribute to the community and in the region in those, uh, in those ways. In terms of the industry and how it's changed, as I referenced, the business has gone from being a brokerage business to being a wealth advisory business. And really what's at the root of that, and it's at the root of many changes in corporate America, is technology and the evolution of technology. So when you think about it, in the old days, in a, in a brokerage context, we controlled the flow of information, we controlled uh, processing trades, and there was some value added to that. These days, trades can be done for nothing, and information is available from multiple sources. So uh, that has really been, that part has been commoditized, which in turn has really pushed uh, the responsibility on us to be advisory in nature. We get paid for the advice that we deliver to our clients. And so, and technology is really at, at the root of that. You've also seen uh, recently the commoditization, if you will, of investment management. So the term robo-advisor you may have seen or read, but that's letting the computer do the work. And so, again, with investment returns being challenged and, uh, you know, the, the, the introduction of the computer into that mix is, again, really pushes us to continue to develop the, our capabilities around advice and really advice beyond investments, which is why the trust company or estate planning work, some of the work we do for business owners in our investment banking group, insurance is a bigger piece of the equation, a lot of financial planning work that we do on behalf of our clients. So it needs to go beyond investments just given the, the, the fact that the investment business, pure investment business, investment management has become commoditized and is, is extremely uh, challenging. So that's really our focus as an organization is to get deeper with our clients, do more for them, uh, be that trusted advisor and expand that relationship that we have with them. We also deal with, uh, again, not unique to anybody in business these days with the impact of a lot of regulation and growing regulation. In fact, how many of you in here have an IRA account? Would you raise your hands if you've got an IRA? So just about everybody in the room. Well. As we speak, uh, there is a proposal from the Department of Labor. Department of Labor has oversight for ERISA, right on down to IRAs. There's a proposal that the Department of Labor now has in the hands of the Office of Management and Budget 
to take any advisor who works with a client who has an IRA and turn that into a fiduciary relationship. And while on the surface, raising the standard of care and, and raising the bar might sound like it has, you know, what's wrong with that? Well, the impact for investors is it's going to reduce choices and actually raise prices as firms take on an added level of responsibility, especially for small investors who need advice uh, the most. For example, of IRA accounts that are below $25,000, 98% of those are currently held in a, quote, brokerage account. That will have to change, and so the price tag on that is going to go up for those investors who have those types of accounts and will not have quite the same level of access to information and important advice going forward. So more to follow on that, but you'll be hearing about this one, I've got a feeling, in some form or fashion. The current administration is actually trying to get this through so that it can be implemented prior to their departure. So this is uh, something that, again, is part of the regulatory regime to make sure that uh, investors are taken care of, but we think that this is actually uh, a solution looking for a problem in an environment that's already highly regulated. So it's not as though this is unregulated territory. It's, it's very highly regulated, so something to keep an eye on. I also mentioned the separation of duties between financial advisory work and municipal bond underwriting, and again, the unintended consequence of that is the smaller issuer who now has to sort of pay for things twice as opposed to potentially getting the economies of scale of an of a FA, an underwriter, working on that, on that deal. And that's, that's really one of the, I guess, negative consequences of, of higher regulation is the unintended consequence of that is it usually hurts the smaller issuer, the smaller investor, and those are typically the ones who need that uh, help the most. You know, as we continue to move forward this year with the presidential election and the political uh, climate that we have going on, one of the things in our industry that I think people frequently lose track of is because we are involved with municipal underwriting and, and the MSRB as an oversight regulatory organization for our business, is our political contributions in this industry are really, really limited. In fact, I can only give per election cycle a maximum, any of our colleagues here, of $250. So in a primary, and I can only give to candidates for whom I can vote, so could not give in, a, in a, an election in another state, could only give in the primary for the party that I represent. In a general election, I could give to another candidate of the other party. But it's, uh, there's, that's actually a good news, bad news thing. So a lot of times it's, uh, it's actually good news when somebody calls and solicits, boy, I'd love to help you, but I really can't. <laughs> the bad news is there are times when you'd like to be able to do a little more than we're able to do. But on the whole, uh, it's really, again, a reflection of just the intensity of regulation. And I've just touched on a few things that are uh, really sort of critical to our business. The, the regulatory influence, the amount of work that we do, our compliance and legal department, just to respond to routine examinations. Uh, it, it is just a significant amount of time and energy and extremely costly for us as, as a firm, as it is for uh, our peer firms as well. So, you know, as, as it relates to Hilliard, like I said, I'm, I'm really proud of the organization. I know the the, the theme for today's meeting was listed as leadership, which I figured gave me the latitude to talk about anything that I wanted to. <laughs> but I'll uh, relate that back to, to Hilliard just a little bit in terms of, I think, the style of organization and, and sort of my leadership style and the style that we try to convey throughout. And that's one of keeping the organization extremely flat, being very open and communicative, having an open door policy. Anybody can call me and I might answer my phone. Um, anybody can stop by my office. I try to meet with clients who come to the home office and we really try and make this a team sport as much as we can. And as I indicated, with advice as the value proposition for our clients, as all these other things become commoditized, really the value add that we offer is the personal service, the professionalism that we can deliver on behalf of our clients. And so that, we need to act that way on a day-to-day -day basis within the organization. So I'm very proud of how we operate as a firm and how we collaborate in an environment that has undoubtedly been tough and I think uh, stands to be very tough going forward. And so then I'll conclude with just a few 
market thoughts, and uh, again, in the interest of full disclosure, being in this industry, I don't spend a lot of time analyzing securities or analyzing markets. We've got other folks who do that, since my responsibility is more at the corporate level. But you can't help uh, being in this industry and not uh, observe what's going on and, and what an incredible set of circumstances we have. The volatility just this morning in the markets as uh, some employment data showed some weakness. We had some volatility in oil prices and the market has been so incredibly correlated with oil here as of late. Net net, I think the overall feeling is that longer term, lower oil prices have some benefits for the economy in terms of consumer spending and, and support for consumers. But we've got the issue associated with China. We've got these geopolitical concerns. We've got an unemployment rate that while low, we still have a, a labor participation rate that's historically low in the low 60s. So it's not all uh, bright on the, on the labor side. Median income stagnation. And again, all of this oil uh, price volatility that is really, and, and then I think we're going to see some difficult earnings comparisons for corporate America. So what has that spelled for the markets? In, in extreme volatility. And I think more volatility is likely to be present as we, as we go forward. We're very, I think, constructive longer term on the markets and think that clients ought to buy U.S. equities really on the dips as you get the opportunity at, at these prices. You know, it's interesting, the Fed raised uh, interest rates in mid-December, raised short-term interest rates. Since that happened, actually intermediate and long-term interest rates have come down 30 to 50 basis points, almost a half a percent. And again, that's really a reflection of low inflation and again, a struggling uh, economy that's looking for footing and direction and, and struggles on the world scene. So again, um, we think that you're probably only going to see the Fed raise rates maybe once in 2016. I think they were on a hoped for schedule to do more than that, but it looks like probably just once if that happens. Wouldn't expect intermediate and long-term rates to go up. So it's not very exciting to have 10-year treasuries yielding one and three quarters or 1.8. So in terms of capital, we think again, uh, from, from a longer-term perspective, that domestic equities is going to give you uh, probably the best risk return trade-off given the, the landscape that we see. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has, and anything is fair game. Thank you, Jim. We'll open up the microphones in the front uh, for any questions. Uh, let me start off. I'll have a question. What about, uh, you, since you're dealing with so much data, uh, and, the th and of course, 20 years ago, we never, you know, terrorism, br data breach, how do you all handle that, or what? what is your strategy? Well, protecting our data is in incredibly important to the organization. In fact, we have somebody and actually a team of people who are dedicated to that. We have a chief uh, sort of a, a risk officer as it relates to technology with the goal of protecting all of our client data. So we have uh, sort of vendor relationships with the same organizations that many of our peer firms have. So there's really been an industry sort of effort to protect data and, and sort of combine resources of multiple firms to make sure that we are protecting our clients. So far, so good on that front. But that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't attempts. So we fend off attempts like everybody does on a fairly regular basis. Great. Jerry. Jim, uh, you did a good job of describing the success of employee ownership and getting Hilliard Lions back for uh, local ownership to play the role it has. You might mention, I think there are a number of people in this room that are involved or own small businesses. You might mention something about Hilliard was instrumental in, in really getting Houchins in terms of setting up its employee stock ownership plan and how successful the Houchins plan has been, which is, means that, you know, it's really been that, and they, that raised the capital for them to, to back Hilliard. So Abs that Absolutely. That's a great story. So Houchins is, a, to, uh, to Jerry's point, is a 90-year-old a uh, ESOP hasn't been an ESOP for its entire history, only in the last 25 years or so as an ESOP. But Houchins is based in Bowling Green. They've got an, they are the nation's largest ESOP, all employee owned, have 17,000 employees as part of 28 different companies that are in the portfolio of companies that Houchins owns. As Jerry indicated, our timing from a Hilliard standpoint was actually 
very good when PNC decided to sell Hilliard because Houchins was sitting on a billion and a half in cash at that particular point in time. They had, they've sold one company in their history, and that was Commonwealth Brands, a generic tobacco company. And they decided to go ahead and monetize that one based on the litigious nature of tobacco. And they uh, in, experienced a, big, a significant gain in that position. So that's what really freed up the capital for them to make the just about $400 million commitment to Hilliard Lions, and then in, we share ownership with them. So they have been a great partner. Like I said, the, the nation's largest ESOP, Bowling Green, Kentucky, they have been content to sort of fly below the radar screen, but have been a just a terrific partner for us. We could not have scripted this thing uh, any better. Some like to refer to them as sort of a, a, a regional version or a Kentucky version of Berkshire Hathaway in terms of their approach. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting. There was a woman who worked there for 40, the receptionist, so I used to go into their headquarters in Bowling Green, a woman by the name of Joyce who was their receptionist. She retired a couple of years ago after 40 years with the company, and of course the, her, her share of that ESOP was three and a half million dollars. So. <laughs> She walked out with three and a half million, acknowledged that her grandkids are going to college and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's a great, great success story. And I'm glad you pointed that out, Jerry, because it's one that people don't know and appreciate as much as they probably should in this state. But they've been a great, uh, a great citizen for sure. Pardon me? She paid zero. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. That was just her share of the, of the ESOP valuation. Hi, Jim. Patrick Welsh. Yeah, Patrick. Uh, thank you for your service to the community. Uh, I was curious, you mentioned the $250 limit uh, that you face in political contributions. Does that affect your ability to contribute to political action committees? And the answer, that's, that's a great question. So I do contribute to the... Uh, Kristen, in my introduction, uh, acknowledged that I'm a board member of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, which is the major trade organization for our industry, also known as SIFMA. And it kind of sounds like a disease, but it, uh, believe me, they do, they do great work on behalf of our industry and, and represent us extremely well to include dealing with a lot of this regulatory stuff. So we meet frequently with regulators. Uh, and also do some work on Capitol Hill. To that point, we can contribute to a PAC. So, and I do do that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Leland? I was intrigued by your comment about, uh, Leland Woodmancy, uh, formerly from the County Medical Society here. Um, I was intrigued by your comment about the robo computer generated advice and thinking about that my guess would be that that would tend to focus on short-term micro data that would tend to destabilize the market by causing overreactions. Am I right? And then can you give us kind of a long-term view of where you see the market headed? Yeah, so to, to answer your question, robo-advisor would not necessarily uh, contribute to computerized trading and, and rapid transactions. What robo would do is take a particular individual sort of financial profile um, and then develop a portfolio and an asset allocation model based on that particular client's risk tolerance as generated by a computer profile. So you'd fill in your, your uh, income and your, you know, what your needs are going to be, all that sort of stuff, and then it, it'll spit out a, an asset allocation for you. So that's how that would be handled, and then would modestly adjust as your circumstances change. Uh, now there is a lot of there are computer uh, algorithm algorithms and, and computer trading that's different than than the robo advisor uh, approach that do contribute to some market volatility. And again, that's uh, it can be an unfortunate thing for our industry because it tends to have clients think that it's not a fair game for them, and so it can be an un, sort of an unnerving set of circumstances when you have computer-driven volatility that drives the market. But on the whole, so back to your then your, your final question, we view things on a, on a longer-term time horizon and, again, feel like equities are the place to be, especially when you look at 
where the trade-offs are in terms of fixed income and the low yields that are uh, available there. Doesn't mean that you're going to have that, that the days of juicy double-digit returns are coming back anytime soon. We're going to look more at, I think, at sort of mid-single-digit returns as sort of the norm, and especially in this interest rate environment. But the longer-term prospects for, um, I think, owning equities is the, is the place to be. And, and corporate America has a resilience and ability to adjust to the, the landscape as it changes. And I think that'll be the case going forward. Go ahead. Deborah. Deborah Hoffer, Jr. Achievement. Um, Jim, I'm aware of and we're all aware of how much you do to support public education. And I don't want to lose the opportunity for you to have the chance to share with us what you think's going on that's good at Jefferson County Public Schools and how we all can help to make them better. Great. Thank you. Well, um, and sort of the, the catalog that as uh, Kristen indicated in my introduction, I am the chairman of the Public Education Fa Jefferson County Public Education Foundation, and we're a 501c3 that is connected to JCPS. We've actually uh, separated it to some extent to make it a more effective fundraising organization and to make it more active. Sam Corbett is our new executive director coming up on his one-year anniversary in that capacity. But the foundation, uh, at the foundation, we have our board meetings in, in various schools around the district. And I can tell you, if you ever get the opportunity to go visit a school, you ought to, you ought to take that opportunity. I see some of our board members are here, and, and Ken and Carl and, and some others are in the room. Um, you'll be amazed at how much, uh, how many good things are happening in the schools. People don't understand and appreciate what a challenge public education is. 65, in JCPS, 65% free and reduced lunch. I don't know, several thousand English as a second language. Uh, all of the disciplinary issues that they have to, and, and uh, that are a result of behavioral issues, and, and so they've got to they've got to take them all. Visit Churchill Park, which is out off Crittenden Drive, right there next to Burger King, as you get off I-65. That's for severely handicapped students. You go in there, and it's almost one-on-one -on -one teacher to student uh, because of the severe handicap. JCPS has to take them all. Uh, Westport TAP, Teenage Pregnancy Program, out on Westport Road, about 200 pregnant girls out there who are high school students. So when you look around the district and look at all the specialized programming, all the things that happen, um, I really think that uh, Superintendent Hargens has the toughest job in the city, and she continues to stay focused. I think we are absolutely moving in the right direction. And if we're going to have uh, more successful, better public education going forward, it needs to be a community issue. You can't just say, Donna Hargens, take it, run with it, and tell us about it. We hope you do well. We're going to have to embrace this as a community. So opportunities to mentor students. The Everyone Reads was a great program that got people out into the schools helping uh, tutor kids on reading. But there are a lot of great things happening within our schools that unfortunately just don't see the light of day like they should. Uh, the media would prefer to talk about a bus that was late or a student that was got left on a bus inadvertently or whatever might have happened, but there's a lot of great work that's, uh, that's happening within Jefferson County Public Schools, and it's something as a community that we need to get behind. Jim Allen, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks for today.